ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد then to continue with al-aqidah al-aqidah tahawiyah with the explanation of Sheikh Salih al-Fawzan hafizahullah then last week we had the second point the point that occurs on tw- page 28 of the explanation naqulu fi tawhidillahi mu'taqidin bi tawfiqillah inna Allah wahidun La sharika lah. That we say with regard to Tawheed of Allah, holding as our creed and belief, due to the guidance to correctness granted by Allah, that Allah is one, having no partner. And with regard to questions on last week, then who can remember the explanation of the word Tawheed in the Arabic language. The word Tawheed in the Arabic language. It's a verbal noun from the verb Wahada, to make something one. And who can remember the explanation of Tawheed in the Islamic legislation? I'm singling out Allah, the Most High, with regard to worship and avoiding the worship of everything besides Him. We also had that Tawheed has been categorized by the scholars who have studied, studied the Qur'an and have extracted from their study that Tawheed is of three categories. Or three branches. Who can remember these three categories of Tawheed? Who can remember the first of these, Tawheed Arububiya, Tawheed of Lordship? Who can briefly explain what that covers? Tawheed Arububiya, Tawheed of Lordship. Who can briefly mention what that co- what that covers? <laughs> Whose actions? It is briefly to the Tawheed of Allah with regard to his actions. With regard to his actions of being the creator, his creating, giving life, giving death, giving provision, and so on, and so on. Being in control of all the affairs, and so on. Tawheed al uluhiya what does that cover? Tawheed with regard to the people's actions, their actions towards Allah, meaning their acts of worship, the outward ones and the inward ones. And what about Tawheed al Asma wa Sifat? What does that cover? No. 
affirming, meaning affirming whatever attributes of perfection Allah has affirmed for himself or the Messenger Allahu Alaihi Wasallam has affirmed for him and negating whatever deficiencies Allah has negated for himself or the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam negated for him. We had a point that the ayahs in the Quran which mention Allah's lordship, Allah's creation of the heavens and the earth, his creation of mankind, and so on. These ayahs are mentioned as a proof and as an evidence. As a proof and evidence for what? No. The, as the brother mentioned, as a proof for Tawheed al uluhiya as a proof that Allah alone should be worshipped. So the ayahs where Allah mentions the different aspects of the creation, of, of His creating everything, creating the whole creation, and being the Lord of the whole creation, and its provider, its sole provider, the only one who gives life and death. All these ayahs are a proof that therefore, He alone is the one who deserves to be worshipped. With regard to a person who believes in that, in Tawheed or Rububiyyah, a person who believes that indeed Allah is his Lord, Allah alone is his creator, his sole provider, Allah alone is the one who gives him life and death, and that Allah alone is in control of the universe. What do we say about such a person? What is the ruling on such a person? No. No. But we say about about such a person that contrary to the people of innovation, that, that that is not sufficient to make him a Muslim. That is not sufficient to enter him into Islam. Even if he believes all of that, because the pagans of Quraysh, those whom the Prophet ﷺ fought against, they believed in all of that. But they were still fought against and they did not enter into Islam by that until they except for the, those who affirm uluhiyah, Allah's sole right to worship, and thereupon worship of Allah alone. <clears throat> the author, rahimahullah, when he mentioned this, that we say with regard to Allah's tawheed, holding as our creed, he said, bitawfiqillah, that we hold this as our creed, bitawfiqillah, by Allah's tawfiq, by Allah's grant of success. Why did he make that point, or what's the point that was explained by Shaykh al-Fawzan that he said we believe this by Allah's tawfiq by Allah's grant of success what was the point that the Shaykh extracted from this <coughs> it's because as a result of the pool and the whole of Allah and not as, as a result of your actions yeah it mean, it's showing the servant submission in, de- in declaring that this is his creed affirming that that came about this being upon the correct creed comes about because Allah Allah has granted that. So it's a servant it's the servant statement of submission before Allah. And it's not a person doesn't by his own efforts and own striving and own own ability come to be upon the correct creed, but rather because Allah has guided him to that. <clears throat> With regard to the last phrase that Allah is one, La Sharika la Allah is one, having no partner. We mentioned a point from Sheikh, Sheikh al-Albani, rahimahullah, that our statement that la sharika lah, there is no partner for Allah, this will not be completed except by denying three forms of shirk. What were these three forms of shirk that must be denied? Yeah. I mean shirk with regard to the three forms of tawheed, shirk with regard to Allah's lordship, shirk with regard to his worship, his uluhiya, his sole right to worship, and shirk with regard to his names and attributes. And we had examples of shirk in each one of them. Who can remember the example of shirk with regard to Allah's lordship? As an illustration, and Shaykh al-Albani gave examples to illustrate each one of these forms of shirk. So what's the example that he gave for regard to shirk with regard to Allah's lordship? Yeah. 
No. Indeed, Shaykh al Albani mentioned that from that is declaring that there is another creator along with Allah. Holding that there is a, a creator along with Allah, such as the saying of the Magians, the Majus, those who hold that there is a creator of good and a creator of evil. And he went on to explain, and likewise, the saying of the Qadriya resembles that saying, which is why they're described as being the Majus of this Ummah. They affirm that, that man creates his own actions. So it's as if they're affirming another creator besides Allah. Who can remember an example that Shaykh al-Albani gave for shirk with regard to uluhiyyah, Allah's right to worship? We mentioned seeking help from others, seeking help from the dead, seeking help from other than Allah, from the prophets and the righteous, those who are in their graves. Just in case some brothers get surprised, questions are not limited to those who put their hands up. Questions are for anyone who is here, inshallah. Who can mention then shirk with regard to Allah's names and attributes? An example <coughs> of shirk with regard to Allah's names and attributes. An example that Sheikh Al-Bani mentioned last week. No. Yeah. He mentioned as an example of that, people claiming knowledge of the hidden and unseen. Which is Allah alone knows the hidden and the unseen, the ghaib. So any who claim that there are those who have knowledge of the hidden and unseen, then that is shirk with regard to Allah's names and attributes. Now, then with regard to this week, then moving on to point number three, he continued, "Wala shay amithluhu," and there is nothing like him, and there is nothing like him. Sheikh Al Fawzan said, "This is taken from the saying of Allah the Most High, 'Laysa kamithlihi shay.' So Tashura." The 42nd, the 42nd surah, ayah 11. Laysa kamithlihi shay. And there is nothing like him. I mean, there is nothing like Allah. He said, and also the saying of Allah the Most High, وَلَمْ يَكُلُ اللَّهُ كُفُوًا أَحَد Surah Al-Ikhlas, the 112th surah, ayah 4. With the explanation... And there is none equal or comparable to him, meaning to Allah. And his saying, he the most high, فَلَا تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا Surah Al-Baqarah, the second surah, ayah 22. With the explanation, so do not set up any rivals for Allah. Shaykh Al-Fawzan said, meaning those who are alike or similar to him. And he quotes a fourth evidence for this point. He said, And his saying, He the Most High, هَلْ تَعْلَمُ, هل تعلم لَهُ سَمِيَّةً Surah Maryam, the 19th Surah, Ayah 65, with the explanation, Do you know of any namesake for him? Do you know of any namesake for Allah. And as Shaykh Sa'adi, Abdul Rahman ibn Nasir al Sa'adi, Rahimahullah, said in tafsir of this ayah that the ayah is in the form of a question. Do you, Hal ta'lamu lahu samiyya? Do you know of any namesake for Allah? It's in the form of a question, but what is meant is a denial, a negation. Thus, difamun bima'na nafi. It's in the form of a question, but what it means is a denial. There is no namesake for Allah. Shaykh al-Fawzan said, meaning anyone like him, 
one who can share his name, he the perfect and most high. So he's just quoted four separate proofs for this point. La shay'a mithluhu. And there is nothing like Allah. Then he said, So at tamthil, there being anyone like him, and at tashbih, there being anyone resembling him, both of these are negated for Allah the mighty and majestic. And these two words here, at tamthil and at tashbih, as Shaykh Yahya al Hajuri, Hafidhullah, when he came and he was teaching us the book, if we remember those who were here, then he mentioned that at tamthil, declaring anyone to be like Allah, that means declaring that there is anything or anyone who is totally like Allah. And at tashbih, means declaring that there is someone who resembles Allah, meaning in some aspects. So the first one declaring like, to be someone someone like Allah, or secondly, at, that's at, tam, at tamthil, or at tashbih, de- declaring that there is someone or something which resembles Allah in some aspects. So Shaykh al-Fawzan here, he said, both of these, at tamthil, declaring there is any, anyone like Allah, and at tashbih, Declaring there is anyone resembling him, both of these are negated for Allah, the mighty and majestic. So no one from his creation resembles him. So this is what is obligatory. That we affirm whatever Allah has affirmed for himself. And we hold that as our creed. However, we do not hold that he resembles anyone from his creation, nor do we hold that he is like his creation, he the perfect and most high. So the Shaykh makes the point here, that indeed we affirm for Allah whatever he has affirmed for himself. Regard attributes, we affirm that for him. However, as he said, along with the fact that we we affirm his attributes, we do not Hold that anyone from his creation resembles him. Or rather, we, we do not hold that anyone from his creation resembles him. He said this is what is obligatory, that we, we affirm whatever Allah has affirmed for himself, and we hold it as our creed and belief. And we do not hold that he resembles anyone from his creation. And we do not hold that he is like his creation. He, the perfect and most high. And he said, so this contains a a refutation of the mushabbiha. This point contains a refutation of the mushabbiha. Those who believe that Allah is like his creation. Those who do not differentiate between the creator and the creation. And this is a false and futile position. So he's mentioning refutation of the mushabbiha, those who hold that the creator, Allah, is like his creation. So this is a false and futile position. Then he said, and opposite to this position is the position of the mu'attila, those who negate Allah's attributes, those who deny Allah's attributes, they are the opposite extreme. He said, those who go, who go beyond limits in declaring Allah free. Those who go beyond limits in tanzih, declaring Allah free. To such an extent that they deny for Allah that which he has affirmed for himself with regard to names and attributes. Doing so as they claim to fr- flee away from declaring him to be like his creation. So Sheikh Al-Fawzan here has mentioned these two extreme groups. On the one hand, the first group, those who declare that Allah resembles his creation. Allah in his attributes, he resembles the creation in their attributes. And at the opposite extreme, those who deny 
Allah's attributes. The Mu'attila. The first group, the Mushabbiha. The second group, the Mu'attila. Those who are so afraid of affirming his attributes that they start to deny his attributes. The Mu'attila. The Shaykh said, so both of these two groups go beyond the limits. The Mu'attila, those who deny his attributes, they go beyond limits in Tanzih. They go beyond limits in declaring him free and in denying any likeness. Whereas the other group, the Mushabbiha, those who declare Allah's attributes to be like, the, like those of the creation, they go, they go beyond the limits in affirmation. I mean, they affirm the attributes but go beyond limits. They affirm Allah's attributes but then go on to say, but they're like the attributes of the creation. And the Shaykh said, whereas the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they take the moderate and middle position. In between these two deviant extremes, the people of the Sunnah take the middle route. So they affirm for Allah whatever He affirmed for Himself. In accordance with what befits His Majesty. Without tashbih, without declaring His attributes to be like the attributes of the creation. And without ta'atil, without denying His attributes. Doing so in accordance with the saying of Allah the Most High. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيءُ الْبَصِيرُ وَهُوَ السَّمِيءُ الْبَصِيرُ Surah Ashura, the 42nd Surah, Ayah 11. So the Shaykh said, that the position of the people of the Sunnah is in accordance with this Ayah. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيءُ الْبَصِيرُ There is nothing like him, and he is the all-hearing, the all-seeing. So this ayah gives a tremendous principle for the people of the sunnah. And this ayah should be memorized by everyone who, who hasn't already memorized it and should be understood. There is, with the explanation, there is nothing like him and he is the all-hearing, the all-seeing. Shaykh al-Fawzan said, so his saying, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There is nothing like him. This negates and denies any tashbih any resemblance with the creation. So the first part of the ayah denies any resemblance with the creation. And his saying in the second part, وَهُوَ السَّمِيءُ الْبَصِيرُ And he, Allah, is the all-hearing one, the all-seeing one. This is a negation of ta'atil. It's a denial and negation of those who deny and negate his attributes. So this is the position which the people of the Sunnah and the Jama'ah proceed upon. So this ayah is a refutation of both of these extreme groups. It's a refutation of those who say that Allah's attributes are like those of the creation, the Mushabbiha, because of the first part of the ayah. Laysa kamithlihi shay, there is nothing like him. And it's a refutation of the second deviant group at the other extreme, the Mu'attila. Those who negate his attributes, those who flee away from affirming attributes for Allah. Because they say, if we affirm for Allah attributes, then the creation have attributes like that. So we'll be, if we affirm these attributes, such as Allah's face, his hand, and so on and so on. If we affirm these things for Allah, then it says if we're making him like the creation. So we'll negate, we'll deny these things. We won't affirm these attributes for Allah. So the second part of the ayah is a refutation of them. وَهُوَ السَّمِيءُ الْبَصِيرُ And he is the all-hearing the all-seeing. I mean, he is the one who has the attribute of hearing and seeing. So this ayah is a refutation of both of these extreme groups and a proof for the people of the sunnah, those who are upon the middle path. Then Shaykh al-Fawzan finished by saying, and so therefore it is said, al-mu'attilu ya'budu adaman wal-mushabbihu ya'budu sanaman وَالْمُوَحِّدُ يَعْبُدُ إِلَاهًا وَاحِدًا فَرْدًا صَمَدًا This little phrase that summarizes this whole point that we just had. Which is why it is said that the Mu'attil, and we should be aware of these terms, the Mu'attil, one who negates Allah's attributes, and the Mushabbih, 
the one who declares his attributes to be like the attributes of the creation. So as it is said, Al-Mu'attil, the one who negates Allah's attributes, worships something which does not exist. And the Mushabbih, the one who declares Allah's attributes to be like those of the creation, he worships an idol. And the Muwahid, the person upon true Tawheed, he worships the sole one who deserves worship, the one who is single, the independent Lord and Master. Al Mu'attilu Ya'budu Adaman, Wal Mushabbihu Ya'budu Sanaman, Wal Muwahidu Ya'budu Ilaham Wahidan Fardan Samadan. This phrase that neatly summarizes what we just had. The one who just to explain it that the first per, the first person, the Mu'attil, the one who denies Allah's attributes and doesn't affirm any attributes for Allah, therefore he worships that which has no attributes, something that doesn't exist. Something that does not exist. So he worships something non existent. The one who flees away from affirming any attributes for Allah. He worships something that does not exist. Whereas the second one, the one who affirms Allah's attributes, but then goes on to say, and his attributes are like the attributes of the creation. Then in effect, he is worshipping an idol. Because Allah's attributes don't resemble the attributes of the creation. Whereas the third one, the person upon Tawheed, he is the one who worships Allah alone. <clears throat> Just briefly, with regard to what Shaykh al-Albani said in his notes here, he mentioned about this point, وَلَا شَيْءَ مِثْلُهُ And there is nothing like him. He said, this is one of the, one of the fundamentals, from the fundamental principles of Tawheed, which is, that with regard to Allah the Most High, ليس كمثله شيء. There is nothing like Him. لا في ذاته ولا في صفاته ولا في أفعاله. There is nothing whatever like Allah, neither in His self, His that, nor in His attributes. I mean, there is nothing like Allah with regard to Allah's self. And there is nothing like Allah with regard to His sifat. There is nothing like Allah with regard to Allah's attributes. And there is nothing like Allah with regard to His actions. He said, however, the innovators and the people of Ta'wil, those who twist Allah's attributes, they take a principle by which they deny many of Allah's attributes, He the Exalted and Most High. So whenever their hearts are too constricted to believe in one of His attributes, He the Majestic and Most, He the Mighty and Majestic, then they perform ta'wil, they twist that attribute and try and destroy it and deny it. He said, so they deny an attribute. And they use as an evidence for what they are doing his saying, I mean, those who deny Allah's attributes say we won't affirm for Allah a hand, we won't affirm for Allah a face, we will not affirm that Allah is ascended over his throne, we will not affirm such and such and such and such, he's descending. All of these things, the excuse that they do it, Shaykh al Bani said, they use as a, an excuse his saying, There is nothing like him. He said, Pretending to be ignorant of the end of the ayah, wa huwa sami ul basir, and he is the all hearing, the all seeing. So this ayah gathers, declaring him free, along with affirming his attributes. So whoever wishes to be safe and sound in his creed, then he should declare Allah the Most High to be free from any resemblance to the creation. Without explaining his attributes away and without denying his attributes. Rather, he should affirm for Allah the mighty and majestic with regard to attributes, everything which he has affirmed for himself in his book or occurs in a hadith of his Prophet without declaring that the Creator resembles creation. This is the position of the Salaf 
and the author, rahimahullah, was upon it, following on from Abu Hanifa and the rest of the Imams. As a further point, then Shaykh Yahya al Hajuri, Hafizullah, when he was over here, then he made a point as well amongst the points he made was that at Tashbih, declaring that there is a resemblance between the Creator in his attributes and the creation in their attributes. He said, Tashbih is of two categories. Firstly, Tashbih of the creation with the Creator. I mean, declaring something from the creation to be like the Creator. And he gave us an example of that, like the action of the Christians. Those who declared resemblance between Isa alayhi salam and Allah. So the first category is declaring something or someone from the creation to have attributes like those of the Creator, like the Christians did with regard to Isa alayhi salam. And the second category of tashbih is declaring that the, the attributes of the Creator, declaring Allah's attributes to be like attributes of the creation. And this is the practice of the mushabbiha. Declaring, who declare that Allah's attributes, they affirm Allah's attributes, but then go on to say, and His attributes are like those of the creation. And he mentioned that one of the first of these people was called Dawood al-Jawaribi. Who actually came out and stated that he affirmed for Allah all his attributes. Or he, and he affirmed that Allah's attributes are just like those of, of human beings. And he said that he affirms for Allah all human attributes. Except one or two. Except he said the beard and the private parts. Apart from that, he affirmed every human attribute as being an attribute of Allah. This is the saying of the Mushabbiha. And as for this person, that he mentioned that Dawood, this person Dawood al-Jawaribi, then the scholars of his, his time, the time of the Tabi'een, scholars such as Ibn Lahi'ah, they gave the judgment that he should be executed. And however he died, this person died when... He died before he was executed. So that was the position of the Mushabbiha. And with regard to the next point in the book, point number four, وَلَا شَيْءَ يُعْجِزُهُ And there is nothing which causes him to be incapable. There's nothing which causes Allah to become incapable. Shaykh al Fawzan said, This is an affirmation of the perfection of His power and ability. I mean, when we say about Allah, nothing makes Him incapable. Then we're affirming His perfect power and ability. And he gives three ayahs as evidence for this point. He said, Allah the Most High said, وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ Surah Al-Ma'idah, the fifth surah, ayah 120. And Allah has full power over everything. And he the Most High said, وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ مُقْتَدِرَةٌ Surah Al-Kahf, the 18th surah, ayah 45. And Allah was... And is fully capable of everything. And he the Most High said, and he quotes the third ayah, إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَلِيمًا قَدِيرًا Surah Fatir, ayah 44, with the explanation, He, Allah, always was and is all-knowing, all-powerful. عَلِيمًا قَدِيرًا all-knowing, all-powerful. Then Shaykh al-Fawzan said, and the term of Allah's name, Al-Qadir, the all-powerful one. Al-Qadir means the one who is extremely powerful. 
So his power, he the perfect and most high, is such that there is nothing that can cause him to be unable. Whenever he wants something, then he just says to it, Kun, be, and it is. Sheikh Fawzan said, So this contains affirmation of the qudra, the power and ability of Allah the Mighty and Majestic. And it contains affirmation that His power includes and covers everything. Then he said, And as for, for the term which some authors use about Allah, إِنَّهُ عَلَى مَا يَشَاءُ قَدِيرٌ I mean, there's some people when they write books, they write in them with regard to Allah, that Allah has full power over whatever He wants. Shaykh Al-Fawzan said, this wording is an error to say about Allah, that Allah has full power over whatever He wants. This is an error. He said, because Allah did not restrict His power to His will. I mean, Allah didn't say about Himself that he, he has power over what He wants. He didn't restrict it to what He wants, to His will or His wish. Rather, He said about Himself that He is ala kulli shay'in qadir. Allah has full power over everything. So therefore, you should say that which Allah, the Perfect and Most High, said about Himself. I mean, you shouldn't restrict His power with, with a statement like that. He said, this only occurs, a similar statement only occurs in the saying of Allah the Most High, وَهُوَ عَلَى جَمْعِهِمْ إِذَا يَشَاءُ قَدِيرٌ Surah Ash-Shura, the 42nd Surah, Ayah 29, with the explanation, and Allah has full power to gather them, the people, all together, when He wishes. إِذَا شَاءَ قَدِيرٌ Allah has full power to gather the mankind together when he wishes. Sheikh al said, because the gathering of the creation has a certain time in the future and he is fully able to gather them at that time, meaning the inhabitants of the heavens and the earth. So Sheikh al is making mentioned that this ayah is not a proof for those, those people who use this phrase here. The ayah doesn't mean that Allah has the power to gather the people if He wants to. It doesn't mean that. It means that when He wishes, which is on the Day of, ju- day of Judgment, then He has the full power to gather the people. So this ayah cannot be a proof for that saying of the people that we should say about Allah, He has full power over whatever He wishes or wants. Rather we say about him, he has full power over everything and we don't restrict his power. Then Shaykh Al-Fawzan said, He the Most High said, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَثَّ فِيهِمَا مِنْ دَابَّهِ وَهُوَ عَلَى جَمْعِهِمْ إِذَا يَشَاءُ قَدِيرٌ This same ayah from Surah Ash-Shura, the 42nd Surah, Ayah 29. So he gives the first part of the ayah to make clear what is meant by the ayah. He said, Quotes the ayah with the explanation. And from his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth. And whatever creatures he has created and spread within them. And he has full power to gather them when he wishes. So this ayah is not meant as a restriction of Allah's power. That he's only powerful over whatever he wants to be powerful over. That is not the correct understanding. As for, finally on this point, then Sheikh Yahya al-Hajuri, Hafidhullah, again when he was over here, he said about this point, وَلَا شَيْءَ يُعْجِزُهُ And there is nothing which causes Allah to be incapable. He said, this is a nafi, this is a denial or a negation. It's a denial of something for Allah. There is nothing that makes Him incapable. He said, this is a denial but it does not what is meant by it is not a mere denial because denial on its own is not from the belief of the ahlus sunnah 
Rather, it is the position of the innovators. So he made a point here that we had also in Aqid al wasatiyah that as for the people of the Sunnah, then they are not people who, when they speak about their Lord, speak about Allah, they just give a list of things which Allah is not. Allah is not this, and He is not that. Allah is not this, and nor is He that. He is not this, nor is He this, nor is He this. They give a long list of things which Allah is not. And you'll hardly find them affirming anything at all. They ne- hardly ever say, but he is this. Or he has this attribute. So this denial in detail is the position of the people of innovation. Where Shaykh Yahya made clear, and Shaykh, Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah before him, made clear, as for the people of the Sunnah, then their way is the way of the Qur'an. Which gives a general denial of certain things for Allah and gives a detailed affirmation of attributes for Him. And whenever there is a denial, then the denial is there to affirm something which is its perfect opposite. So he makes the same point. In this point here, that same principle applies. وَلَا شَيْءَ يُعْجِزُهُ And there is nothing which, make, which causes Allah to be incapable. He said. So this denial is there because of affirmation of its perfect opposite. I mean, we deny that there is anything to make Allah incapable because we affirm the perfect opposite for that for Allah. We don't just say He's incapable, rather we, we affirm His perfect opposite, which we affirm Allah's perfect power. I mean, there's nothing that renders Him incapable because of His perfect power, the perfection of His power and ability. So that is the position of the people of the Sunnah and the Jama'ah. That when we deny something like this, it's only because we're affirming the perfect opposite. Which in this case is where when we say about Allah that there's nothing that makes him incapable, there's nothing that causes him to be incapable, then that is because, as the Sheikh started off by saying, it contains an affirmation of the perfection of his power and ability. Alhamdulillah wa sallallahu ala Muhammad. Any points of clarification? With regard to the point, a brother just making a nice point. Obviously, in the as we said, the explanation, the scholars have praised the explanation of Ibn Abil Iz, his explanation about Tahawiyah. But it is it's excellent and is, is the best explanation, but it's rather long and there's some difficult points in there, which is why some of the reasons we chose Sheikh Al Fawzan's explanation. But amongst the excellent points here, with regard to Tashbih, he makes as the brother said, an excellent point here, that affirming attributes for Allah, when the creation have the like of those attributes, for example, affirming that Allah is the all-knowing, when we at the same time affirm that the creation has knowledge, and affirming that Allah has sight, when the creation has sight, and affirming that Allah has a hand, when the creation of hands. The fact well, this fact is what leads the mu'attila, that's what leads them into denying these certain attributes. Because they say, if we affirm for Allah a hand, then we are amongst the creation, we have hands as well. So if we affirm a hand for Allah, that means we are declaring Him like the creation. And if we affirm for Allah a face, then the creation, amongst the creation we have faces. So if we affirm a face for Allah, then we would, we'll be making Him like the creation. So what we'll do, what they do as a conclusion is, so therefore we'll deny any hand for Allah, and we'll deny any face for Allah, and so on with regard to other attributes as well. They say, in that way, we'll stay clear of making the Creator like the creation. So, Shaykh Fawzan made the point here, and the 
people of the Sunnah make the, the point that this is not the correct way whatsoever. And the same argument of theirs, it, it will end up, you'll end up denying all of Allah's attributes. And even at the end of the day, you'll end up denying Allah's existence. Because Allah exists, but the creation exists as well. So on that same argument, they'll end up denying even Allah's existence, which is obviously clear kufr, which no one will even doubt about. So he made the point that Ibn Abil Iz, in his explanation, he made a very nice point about this, that affirming attributes for Allah, when the creation have attributes, in no way means that we're affirming that the Creator is like the creation. So he says, just because, he said, Allah has affirmed for Himself attributes, when the creation have attributes also, such as, that Allah is hay, living, Allah is alim, the attributes which the creation have as well. Allah is living, and the creation have the attribute of life. Allah is, all, uh, Allah is knowing, alim, and the creation have the attribute of knowledge. And so on and so on. He meant, then he mentions a list of these attributes. Qadir, having ability. Ra'uf, being compassionate. Rahim, being merciful. Aziz, one having might. Hakim, having wisdom. Sami, the one who is all hearing. Allah having hearing. Basir, having sight. And so on. He mentions attributes which Allah affirms for himself. Whereas the creation have attributes as well. Then he mentions different ayahs where these same attributes, where attributes are also affirmed for the creation. And he makes the point, which is the important principle that we have to keep in mind, that when we affirm an attribute for Allah, then we affirm that attribute as befitting Allah's majesty, as being an attribute that befits the Creator. So when we affirm for Allah that He is Hay, the living one, then we affirm that He is the living one as befits the Creator. Meaning a life which befits the Creator, a life which is without end and without beginning, a perfect life. And likewise with regard to Allah's, the rest of Allah's attributes, that we affirm an attribute for Allah as befits His Majesty. And when we affirm an attribute for the creation, then our Shaykh Yahya also made the, the same point, that when we affirm the attribute for the creation, we affirm it as befits the creation and befits their deficiency. So when we affirm a life for the creation, then we affirm a life which is deficient, a life which they didn't have before a certain stage, and a life which will come to an end. And when we affirm for the creation knowledge, we affirm knowledge which they didn't have before, knowledge which they had to get, gain slowly, slowly by stages, which grew, and then which passes away and will end. So we affirm for them knowledge which befits them and befits their deficiency from the creation. So what we affirm for Allah is something different to what we affirm for the creation. We affirm for Allah perfect attributes that befit His majesty. And when we affirm for the creation, we affirm attributes as befits their deficiency as created beings. And he, Sheikh Yahya made the point to make it clarif clear it. Where he said these people who deny Allah's attributes, for example those who say we can't affirm a face for Allah... Because then we'd be making him like the Creator. He said, Then what about amongst the creation? If you said to a person that your face is like the face of a dog, the person, the person would not accept it. One of these people, if he said to the, these deniers, Your face is like the face of a dog, he would not just nod his head and agree with you, Yeah, you're, you're right, my face is just like the dog's face. He would get angry and he would say, He would, he would say, how, how dare you say such a thing? That my face is nothing like the face of a dog. I mean, the dog looks ugly and squat nose and the like, and my face is, you know, Allah has made, made my face much better than that. So he said they become, they'd say, and they realize what a great distinction and difference there is within the creation between the faces of people, the faces of dogs, the faces of clocks, the faces of a cliff, and so on. So that this is just within the creation. That within the creation, faces differ than how about the creator of all. That we, when we affirm a face for him, we affirm a face that is not like the face of the creation. Rather, a face that befits his majesty. A face that befits the creator, not like those of his creation. And the same with regard to the rest of the attributes. And whoever wishes and is able, then they can go back to the explanation of Ibn Abi Liz.
Yeah. Carry going up, it's here and there. Yeah. And the brother just give me an example here of some, something else that Sheikh Yahya made to illustrate the same point that with regard to life, that these, these deniers of certain, Allah's, certain of Allah's attributes on this same argument, and they, of course, they cannot deny or they should not deny Allah's life. They can't come along and say, well, we the creation are living, so therefore we deny that Allah is living. Because if we do affirm that Allah is living, then it will be making right the creation. This is an incorrect argument. And he, he, she, the brother said that Sheikh Yahya made the point. He said, look, he said, we as human beings, creation, are living. And plants, which are also from the creation, are living. But how different is the life of people to the life of plants? It's not the same whatsoever. So how... How on earth can these people think that when by affirming life for, or any other attribute for Allah means that we're declaring him to be like his creation? It's far from the case. So when we deny any when we deny that there being anyone like Allah and we deny any deficiency for Allah, it does not lead us to the opposite extreme, which is denying or, or it does not lead us into denying his attributes. Rather, we, have, we affirm his attributes, but we say about his attributes that he does not resemble his creation in his attributes or in anything else. No. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik